Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. And uh, so I'm going to whip, because I'm born in New York. I talk fast. I got seven minutes. I don't got much time. But let me say, first of all, please, ra how many of you have ever had somebody who you hold close in your heart struggle with drug addiction? Please raise your hands. How many of you have ever had somebody you hold close in your heart use drugs, smoke weed, whatever, and not have a problem with it? Raise your hands. How many of you? How many of you have had somebody you hold close in your heart who spent time behind bars on a drug charge? Raise your hands. I want to talk about all three of those things. I'm going to talk about all three of those things. And let me say, first of all, that the things I'm going to say, I'm going to get you going. I am going to get you going. And what I'm going to say, you know, uh, you know, you know, the views I hold are views that are held by other people who are white, black, brown, yellow, red, and everything in between. They're held by Republicans, Democrats, and independents. They're held by people who've been addicted to drugs and people who love drugs. They're held by people who lost people, people who've been behind bars, people in law enforcement, whatever. And they're opposed by people from all those categories as well. So I just want to be clear, this is a point of view, and it's a point of view that I hope you will all open yourselves up to and think about, because I want to take you someplace on this. I'm going to talk about the harms of the drug war. And when I'm talking about the harms of the drug war, I am not coming at this personally, first and foremost, as somebody who is concerned about racial justice. I am coming at this first and foremost as somebody who is concerned about human rights. Right? I am a human rights activist. And when you are a human rights activist, and when you look at the phenomena of the war on drugs in the United States, you cannot escape the fact that this is not just a human rights issue, but an issue of racial justice as well. Now, I want you to look at the numbers on this thing. The United States, our nation today, we have 5% of the world's, less than 5% of the world's population. We have almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We rank first in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. The Russians, the Belarusians keep huffing and puffing to keep up. They can't do it. We are number one in the world, number one when it comes to locking up our fellow citizens. When it comes to locking up people for drug charges, we went from having 50,000 people locked up on drug charges in 1980 to over half a million people today, never mind the hundreds of thousands of more on parole and probation violations related to drug charges. Right? You look at, the, we lock up in America more people for violating a drug law than all of Western Europe locks up for everything. And they got 100 million more people than we do. Right? Now, I want to ask you something. Do any of you think that would be possible if the vast majority of people behind bars were white? Any of you think that were possible? Because I know and I can see that there is something that happens in this country that when you see a television program, when you see a movie, a photograph, and when you see the pictures of the prison population populations, and when you see they are overwhelmingly black, black men, brown men, that there is that little thing that clicks. That little thing that clicks. That's OK. That's right. Because I know that if the vast majority of those people were white, we would not be leading the world in incarceration rates. I know that the movement for reform would be moving a lot faster than it is right now. And I'll tell you, when it comes to the war on drugs right now, when I look at that in the history of America, I can look from slavery to Jim Crow to the war on drugs. No better system has ever been created to, to accumulate massive, vast millions of people, black people primarily, and put them behind bars, give them a number, take them away from their homes, put them in upstate communities, dissolve their identity, treat them as second and third and fourth class citizens for the rest of their lives. That is what the war on drugs is doing today. Now. It's got to be changed. And changing it means struggling with ourselves as well. Because this was not just a matter of the war on drugs of white people and white races putting black people behind bars. Let's understand that the war on drugs that emerged in 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, that was a bipartisan struggle and a biracial struggle. That the people who supported those original crack powder laws were white and black. That the people who opposed needle exchange programs to stem the spread of AIDS were white and black that the people who bought into all of this hysteria were white and black. And that means, quite frankly, that we have to look in ourselves and in our fears and in deep, deep down and get ourselves uncomfortable because if we're going to uproot this from American society, it is only going to be from this critical self-examination. I want each one of you to please think back 20 years ago when crack was devastating inner city communities. Were you the one saying, lock them up, lock them up, put them behind bars? Do were you, when people were saying that we need a needle exchange program to stop the spread of AIDS, were you saying, I don't want to give a drug, give a needle to a junkie? Why would I enable their addiction? Were you the one saying that? And now maybe you understand that that's not right? 
because there is a price to a slow learning curve. When other nations understood what was right 20 years ago, we were slow. And the price of our slowness was an incarcerated population that now leads the world. The price of our slow learning curve was hundreds of thousands of people dying of HIV AIDS. We can no longer afford to have a slow learning curve. We have to accelerate our learning curve. And we have to understand that no matter how much we hate drugs, that the war on drugs is not the answer, that the criminalization of criminal justice is not the answer, that it is always a mistake to call in our oppressors to save ourselves from ourselves. I'll tell you something. 1.8 million people being arrested now, it's black people. You want to know something? Twice as many people get busted for marijuana today as was true 25 years ago. If they've been arresting as many people for marijuana 25 years ago as they are now, you know who just might have gotten arrested? That guy in the White House. And would that guy in the White House be sitting in the White House today if he'd been arrested for marijuana? How many people are being derailed from this? How many people? So what I want to understand is that is there going to be a collective movement to end this? I am so happy. When we were doing a ballot initiative in California to try to shift resources from prison and, and, and parole into treatment, that Alice Huff and the NAACP, they signed on to that. I was so happy that my organization was leading the effort to repeal the Rockefeller drug laws that Ben Jello sent out an NAACP alert not just to New York members but to the entire nation, NWC, because he knew those laws were wrong. But it can't just be about tinkering around the edges. We have a systemic problem and we have an ideological problem. No matter how much you hate drugs, no matter how much you have seen the worst that drugs can do, the war on drugs, the criminal justice system, and the criminalization approach cannot and will not be the right way. It does not make sense to put the resources into the hands of the prison industrial complex. You want money? We want money for treatment and education and health care and housing? Then we can't have the fastest building prison system in the world. We can't have a prison industrial complex absorbing $100 billion a year. We cannot have such a system. We cannot have such a system. So. I hope and I pray that as these reforms come up and as people look and they start talking about more sensible, not just giving lip service, that we all recognize a moral, a moral obligation to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug policy as much as possible. We are never going to be a drug-free society. There has never been a drug-free society. There never will be a drug-free society. Our challenge as human beings and communities is to accept that reality and to learn how to live with this reality so that drugs cause the least possible harm and, in some cases, the greatest possible good. That is our obligation. It is to uproot and dig out our fears and to move into another world in which our nation's drug policies are grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. Thank you very much.